Biology 100, Unit 5, Ecology. Where things live. The habitat of an organism is the specific environment where it lives. For example, under a log would be the specific habitat in which you would find a pill bug, or a roly-poly, depending on what you want to call them. The forest canopy would be a really good place to find a bromeliad. That would be its habitat. Some frog species might show up in shallow water. That would be their habitat. Habitat is a relatively narrow concept, a very small section of an ecosystem. An ecosystem consists of a community of organisms, that's the biotic component of the ecosystem, and their abiotic environment. The term biotic means alive, so plants are alive, animals are alive, fungi and bacteria, all of these are living things which are a component of the ecosystem. Their abiotic environment includes all the non-living portions of the ecosystem, the soil, the water, the nutrients, the air, all of these are non-living components, abiotic. The biosphere is the sum of all ecosystems on the planet. You may be familiar with the concept of an atmosphere. The atmosphere is the thin shell of gas which surrounds the earth. We could also talk about the hydrosphere. The hydrosphere is the thin shell of water which surrounds the earth, includes all of the lakes and oceans and rivers, all of the surface water and, and uh, the groundwater as well. We could talk about the lithosphere, which is the thin layer of soil and rock which surrounds the earth. But then we could also talk about the biosphere, which is the thin shell of life which surrounds the earth. Ecology is the scientific study of the interactions between organisms and their environments. We can separate ecosystems into these kinds of components. The biotic components, like, as we said before, predators and food sources and uh, competitors and vegetation to hide in. So if you are a squirrel, your competitors would include things like raccoons. They're looking for the same types of resources that you are. Your predator might include something like a fox. Uh, your vegetation might include an oak tree, which you use to make your home, or partially your food sources as well. That might be uh, acorns or that sort of thing. Abiotic components are the non-living portions of an ecosystem. They would include things like the temperature, how often, uh, how cold or how warm does the temperature get in this area? How much water is available? What is the rainfall pattern like? The amount of precipitation? What kind of nutrients are available in the soil? Is this a nutrient rich area or nutrient poor area. These are the non-living abiotic components of the environment. One abiotic component of the environment that is very important is the energy source of that environment. Organisms require energy to live, and ultimately the energy source for all ecosystems on the planet, with the singular exception of hydrothermal vents deep under the ocean, is the sun. The sun provides all of the energy to ecosystems. Now that's very easy to see in plants, as plants are autotrophs. Autotrophs are self-feeders. And that means that they're able to take energy from their non-living environment and convert it directly into chemical energy. They do this through the process of photosynthesis, which is accomplished in their chloroplasts. You may remember chloroplasts as an organelle contained inside plant cells from way back in Unit 2. But that same energy that they capture from sunlight is then transferred to herbivores when the herbivores eat those plants and digest those sugars in order to unleash that energy through cellular respiration respiration. The herbivores are then eaten by carnivores, which gain that same energy still. Some energy is lost at every level of the ecosystem, and we will see some areas where uh, interesting consequences arise because of that inefficiency, but ultimately the sun is the power source of all ecosystems. Now, not all areas have the same amount of sunlight. Areas close to the equator have constant sunlight virtually year-round, whereas areas close to the poles have limited sunlight for at least part of the year. This is the reason why we have winter and summer. The Earth's axis tilts toward and away from the sun, giving us more sunlight and longer days, or away from the sun, giving us less sunlight and shorter days. The temperature is another abiotic component of the environment. 
Obviously, some places are colder and some places are warmer, so if you look at Arctic tundra, they are going to be freezing uh, most of the year. Whereas if you check deserts or tropical ecosystems, you will find that they're extremely hot most of the year. Some areas, like around here, are temperate climates, meaning that they have a kind of intermediate temperature, but that goes up and down with the seasons. Each of these environments will have an annual mean temperature. Here, mean means average temperature, so the average annual temperature. It is a big determiner as to what kind of biome you're going to find in an area. A biome is a major life zone, so deserts are a kind of biome. Arctic tundra is a kind of biome. Tropical rainforests are a kind of biome, and temperate deciduous forests like we have here are also a kind of biome, and the temperature is one big determiner as to what kind of biome you're going to find yourself in. Very few organisms can maintain their metabolism at very, very low temperatures. So only those organisms that are able to maintain their metabolism at low temperatures will be found in Arctic biomes, whereas only those organisms that can deal with extremely hot temperatures will be found at desert biomes or in tropical rainforests. You would not be able, for example, to take a polar bear and set it loose inside of a tropical forest, it simply wouldn't be well adapted to that climate. Extraordinary adaptations on the part of the organisms which live in these areas allow them to live outside of that particular temperature range. Even though the water in Antarctica is well below freezing, we have found thriving colonies of bacteria and some plants able to survive in these locations. Here's an example of a kind of organism that's able to thrive even in boiling water, Thermus thermophilus, a heat-loving bacteria. It's able to live in this boiling water created by the geological activity in this location. That orange crust that you see around the lip of this pond, that is not rock, that is a mat of bacteria that are absolutely loving this lovely sauna that they have. Water availability is another major abiotic component of the environment and another big determiner as to what kind of biome you're going to be in. All animals, all organisms, need water in order to survive. If you don't have enough water, you're at risk of drying out, which we call desiccation. Plants require water in order to stand upright. You guys might remember that they use water to fill up their central vacuole, and that the interplay of pressure from the central vacuole and the cell wall is what allows plants to stick upright. If they start to dry out, they will droop down, and that will reduce the rate of photosynthesis. If it reduces the rate of photosynthesis, Synthesis, they may not be able to meet their energy requirements. Water is also one of the ingredients required for photosynthesis, so drying out could reduce it yet again. Water quality is also a factor for fish. They can't go into conditions that are too salty or that are fresh water if they're the wrong kind of fish. pH of the water, that's another consideration. All of these are abiotic components of the environment. A freshwater fish cannot be placed in saltwater environment, and a saltwater fish cannot be placed in a freshwater environment. Each fish is going to have an optimal pH where they are able to survive. Most of them prefer generally neutral water, but not all water is neutral. The availability of nutrients is another abiotic component of the environment. Here we have a couple of different nutrients you might be familiar with, nitrate and ammonia and phosphate. Uh, these are ingredients that you would find in any kind of fertilizer mix that gardeners would be able to buy at a hardware store. The distribution of plants is often determined by the availability of nitrogen and phosphorus in the soil. The structure, pH, and the availability of other kinds of nutrients in the soil will also have an effect. In many aquatic ecosystems, the growth of algae and photosynthetic bacteria is limited by the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus available, and therefore if nitrogen and phosphorus find their way into those ecosystems, bacterial or algal growth will suddenly skyrocket and you'll get what we call bacterial blooms. Those can be very, very bad for an ecosystem, as I'll describe in a moment. For those of you that are familiar with the gases that are found in the atmosphere, you might be surprised to learn that nitrogen is a limiting reagent for algal and bacterial growth, uh, but 
When it comes right down to it, it turns out that the N2 in the atmosphere is not usable by most kinds of organisms. There's a triple bond between the two nitrogen atoms in N2, and very few organisms have the enzyme necessary to break that triple bond. Lightning can do it, so we get some of that N2 turned into uh, other forms of nitrogen when a lightning strikes, but apart from that, basically the only organism that's able to accomplish this is nitrogen-fixing bacteria. These bacteria live in the root nodules of certain plants, and they are a symbiotic organism. They provide uh, nitrogen to all of the plants around, and then the plants are able to provide the bacteria with a nice convenient place to live. And you should thank these nitrogen-fixing bacteria, because without them we wouldn't really have any ecosystems to work with. Humans also can break N2 bonds. We figured out how to do it right around World War II. A gentleman by the name of Fritz Haber was trying to figure out how to make better explosives and munitions for the German war effort, and he happened upon what's called the Haber process, which allowed us to take atmospheric nitrogen and create artificial fertilizers, which dramatically, ultimately, uh, increased agricultural output. He actually probably ended up saving more lives by feeding more people with increased agriculture than he he managed to uh, contribute to ending lives in the war effort. That said, he was a pretty terrible person all around, so I'll move on. There are other bacteria in the soil whose job it is to denitrify the nitrates and ammonia inside the soil and return it back to the atmosphere. This is important because if there was only nitrogen-fixing bacteria, ones that take the nitrogen out of the atmosphere, then slowly but surely, over the course of eons, they would take all of the nitrogen out of the atmosphere and put it into nitrates and ammonia, and then it wouldn't be able to cycle around, so you wouldn't get that nice mixing of of nutrients. Therefore, we need denitrifying bacteria as well to return nitrogen back into the atmosphere so it can cycle around the world. This is what we call the nitrogen cycle, and it's a very good example of the biotic and abiotic components of an ecosystem working together. Nitrogen, a non-living component of the atmosphere, is taken out of the atmosphere by these living bacteria, and then it is delivered in the form of nitrates to the roots of the plant, which then use it to grow and support animals and all other organisms, and then eventually the denitrifying bacteria take what's left and they put it back into the atmosphere and the cycle continues. Now you'd be forgiven for thinking that there's that you would always want more and more nutrients no matter what. However, sometimes too many nutrients can be a very bad thing for ecosystems. So earlier I mentioned that the growth of algae and cyanobacteria in aquatic ecosystems is limited by the amount of nutrients available. But now that humans have cracked how to put together artificial fertilizers, we are able to spread lots and lots of nitrogen and phosphorus all over our gardens and lawns and farms and golf courses and etc. All of the runoff from all of these different areas, the watersheds, are connected throughout the entire central United States, the breadbasket of America. So imagine how much fertilizer is going on every neighborhood's lawn, every golf course, and every farm, and then imagine that all of that nitrogen and phosphorus is being washed out of the soil when it rains and ultimately ends up in the Mississippi River. And then the Mississippi River delivers all of those nit nitrates and phosphates into the Gulf of Mexico. What happens when this occurs is something called eutrophication, or nutrient pollution. When algae uh, get that influx of nutrients coming in, they spike in growth. They're the first thing that's able to grow. They're able to divide and reproduce very, very quickly. However, they don't live very long, so when they die, uh, other organisms in the environment are going to consume them and they will decay through cellular respiration. You guys might remember that cellular respiration requires oxygen, right? Glucose plus oxygen gives you carbon dioxide and water. So all of the oxygen inside the Gulf of Mexico starts getting consumed as these bacteria and algae die off, and that depletes all of the available dissolved oxygen. If you've ever had a pet goldfish, you know that you need to keep the amount of dissolved oxygen in their tank up, either with bubblers or changing out the water periodically. So this results in dead zones, seasonal dead zones, that show up in the Gulf of Mexico every single year, and many dead fish will wash up on the shore essentially as a result of nutrient pollution. All of the nutrients in middle America kind of getting concentrated into one location. This is an ongoing theme with ecology, is that everything is connected. What you do in one location affects what happens in another location, sometimes in very, very profound ways that you might not expect.